Devil Never Cry. What is up everyone, it is me Devil Never Cry, and as you can see from the title of today's video, I got to play Final Fantasy 16. It still feels absolutely surreal to say out loud, but Square Enix were kind enough to invite me down to their latest media and PR event, where I was able to go through an extensive hands-on session with Final Fantasy 16. And so in this video, not only will I be giving you my first impressions of FF16, I'll also be doing a deep dive into the gameplay in combat itself, along with icon or summon battles, the game's control scheme and how well it plays, as well as the ability system and how items and gear are managed. As some of you may know, the combat director behind FF16, Ryota Suzuki, also worked on Devil May Cry 5 as a combat director, so those of you who are fans of hack and slash or character action games are definitely going to want to stick around for that portion of this video, particularly as I think this is one of the best action RPG combat systems we've seen in a long time. So without further ado, let's dive right in. Before we go any further, are you a fan of Final Fantasy? If so, you should definitely like this video and consider subscribing. Not only does it mean that this video will be seen by more Final Fantasy fans out there, it also means you won't miss out on any future FF16 content that's to come. So as we begin, I'd like to preface a few important things that will give context to the demo that I played and by extension, this video. The first of which is that those of you that dislike spoilers can rest easy as you watch this video. We won't be going over any explicit story spoilers. Though I managed to play through quite a few spoilery scenarios, the footage you're seeing here was provided by Square Enix themselves to avoid any major spoilers leaking out altogether. The next thing I'd like to mention is the demo itself. It was split into two separate sections. The first section featured a whole bunch of gameplay as Clive stormed a fortress alongside Sid that then led into a mini-boss that ultimately culminated in us facing off against Benedicta. The second half of this demo was an icon battle, and what's interesting to note here is that Naoki Yoshida himself, who was also present at this event, mentioned that each and every icon battle would play entirely different from the one before it. Next up, I'd like to mention that the demo I played and the footage that you're seeing is from an unoptimized build of the game. They're quite obviously still polishing the game for its release date in June, but they did confirm that the game will have two modes at launch. Performance mode, which quite obviously focuses on frame rate, and quality, which focuses on resolution. And last but certainly not least, one important thing I have to mention is the inclusion of story mode versus action mode. I'll get onto more exactly what this is, but they are not difficulties as many other people have speculated, and they're more to do with game accessibility in general. Okay, so finally, with the preamble out of the way, we can now discuss the combat of Final Fantasy XVI, kicking things off with the control scheme for the game. This isn't an official Square Enix asset by the way, this is a control scheme that I annotated and put together through my notes when playing, so perhaps some of these things may be subject to change, but quite honestly, considering how refined and polished the combat felt, I don't see that changing anytime soon. So let's go through all of these one by one. The first of which is melee. Melee is mapped to square of course, and the combat here and the melee attacks feel incredibly tight, incredibly snappy and responsive, particularly due to the fact that your button presses directly correlate to the amount of attacks that Clive throws out. This feels like such a basic thing to say, but I cannot tell you the disconnect that not having this sort of pin down causes. There were some issues that I had in Final Fantasy 15 where I'd press the attack button once and Noctis would throw out two different attacks, or he'd throw out a fancy animation followed by an incredibly delayed attack, which led to things just feeling sluggish and unresponsive, and I'm glad to say that that isn't the case here. I can also say there is no hold square for auto combo like Final Fantasy XV. And that of course is because there are certain abilities tied to pressing and holding or charging an attack. I can also confirm that there are set combo strings that you are able to follow, which leads me into the next feature I want to discuss, which is magic. Magic is mapped to the triangle button, and you can throw out magic as much as you want. It's not a consumable item, 
Clive can just throw out magic whenever he wants, and the type of magic that he has is dependent on the icon or summon that he technically has junctioned to him at that given point. And the reason that I mentioned magic and set combos is that by alternating melee and magic, you're able to enter a magic burst combo, which has Clive weaving magic and melee attacks quite effortlessly and quite effectively, culminating in quite a powerful combo ender. And now I briefly want to talk about the jump button. The jump of course can be used in and outside of combat, but in combat it has a particular use in that you're able to jump to dodge enemy attacks, you're able to launch enemies and follow them up with a jump for an aerial combo, and for those of you who are a big fan of DMC, you technically can jump cancel some enemies via the stomp ability, though you're only limited to two or three of those in the air, dependent on specific upgrades. And that brings us on to the icon ability, which is mapped to circle. This is an iconic ability that you have access to outside of the icon shift function, which I'll get into in just a second, but it essentially allows you to tap into an icon's innate ability. For example, Phoenix, which Clive initially starts out with, has the Phoenix Shift ability, which is essentially a gap closer. It allows him to immediately dash to whatever enemy that he currently is facing off against. Though, for example, if I have Garuda junctioned instead of Phoenix, this ability now changes to Deadly Embrace, which grips enemies and brings them towards Clive, throwing Clive into the air instead if an enemy is too heavy to be pulled towards Clive. And of course, if I have Titan junctioned instead, this turns into a guard ability, which, as the name implies, guards attacks, allowing you to pull off a just guard with a timing that is just before an attack hits you that turns it into a parry with its own counterattack mechanic. What's cool about all of these abilities is that they have absolutely no cooldown whatsoever, so you can spam them all to your heart's content. Speaking of spamming things, let's talk about the dodge mechanic, which is mapped to R1. By the way, you can't spam the dodge. The dodge feels tight and it feels deliberate. It can be used to cancel out of any of your regular or icon attacks, but it cannot be spammed, leading you to be punished and likely hit with an attack if you try and spam the button without at least timing it. There is also a just dodge mechanic, where if you're able to dodge an attack at the very last second, Clive is able to reprise with his own counter attack, doing hefty damage. And it's also worth mentioning, by the way, that Clive can also dodge in midair. He does have an air dash. And just like the just dodge on the ground, the air dash also feels challenging, yet rewarding when you're able to pull it off. Next up, we have the icon shift or icon modifier ability, which is tied to the R2 button. By holding this button down during combat, your melee and magic buttons are modified into different things altogether. They're turned into fantastically powerful icon abilities which have their own cooldown tied to them. These are attacks that can't be spammed and you'll definitely want to use only when the boss is vulnerable, allowing you to capitalize on damage. And then on the opposing trigger, the L2 button, we have the Cycle Icon ability. This allows you to change which icon is currently junctioned to Clive, therefore also changing what his icon abilities are. In the demo, we had three icons to switch between. We could vary up the order of these icons, allowing us to essentially weave our own combos of devastation and destruction by switching out our icons mid-combo. We could even have less than three equipped, we could simply rock just the one, just Phoenix, or we could even have two. I'm not sure if it's because it's a demo that we were only limited to swapping between three different icons, or if, for example, in the final game, we'll be able to make a loadout of, say, eight icons we'd be able to switch between in real time. Up next, Limit Breaks. You can enact Clive's Limit Break by pressing in both of the thumbsticks, and it would enable the Semi-Prime function, which would essentially buff Clive's damage, buff up his defense, speed up his attacks and movement, and regenerate his health. The buildup of Limit Break itself is directly underneath Clive's health bar, as you can see in the UI, and it's essentially built up not only by attacking enemies, but also by taking damage. I'm not sure if the Semi-Prime function is the only Limit Break Clive will have access to, 
Considering how early we are into the game and how this was a demo build, I get the feeling that there's more to it that they're saving in store for when the game officially releases. The last two things I want to talk about on the control scheme are the lock-on feature and the shortcut feature. Lock-on in this game is done by pressing the L1 button, it is a toggle lock-on so you can toggle it on and off with a simple button press, and it essentially allows you to lock on to a singular enemy to allow you to focus your attacks. Of course you can then switch your lock-on at any given moment by using the right thumbstick. Then we have the D-pad, or the directional pad. This serves one of two functions, the first of which is item shortcuts. As the name states, you can set items to be used in combat on the up, right and down buttons on the D-pad, though if you press the left button, you switch into toggle commands. Toggle in this game is Clive's trusted canine companion, both inside and outside of combat. When in combat, you can give Torgal simple commands, allowing him to heal you, to bite enemies, or to completely ravage them. Not only does it allow for a further layer of strategy in combat, but it seems that in the world of Velisthia, Dog again is man's best friend. As we're talking about our trusty canine companion Torgal, it's worth discussing the guidance feature. It's been confirmed that Final Fantasy XVI won't be open world, but will feature incredibly expansive and large zones large enough perhaps for you to get lost in, and so if you ever find yourself wondering where to go to follow the main objective, you're able to press and hold the left analog stick to have Toggle guide you and have the camera essentially thrust itself in the direction that you need to go, and by following your companion he'll take you exactly where you need to be, essentially alleviating the need for giant quest markers or giant markers on your map. Okay, so I know that was a lot to dive in when it comes to the control scheme, but there is still more that we absolutely have to discuss. Next up, we have the health and will mechanic that relates to enemies. Enemies in this game have two sets of health bars. The first of which is their overall health bar, which when it hits zero, they'll simply perish. Then we have the will bar, or as it's more commonly known as, a stagger bar. Through continuous and repetitive attacks, you can quite literally destroy an enemy's will to fight. When this bar essentially hits a midway point, the enemy will flinch out of whatever it is they're doing, whether it's dodging or attacking. When it hits zero, they'll go into a down state, where they'll be vulnerable to extra damage. When you attack an enemy or a boss whenever they're in this down state, through the use of consecutive and continued attacks, you'll be able to increase the amount of damage your attacks do, culminating in a boost of 150% damage. It's also worth noting that weapons in this game have two types of damage statistics. Regular damage, or the damage they do to enemy's health bar, and will damage, the damage they do to an enemy's will gauge. I'd also like to make note that elemental weaknesses are still a thing in Final Fantasy XVI. The boss that I faced off against at the end of the demo, Garuda, had a particular weakness to fire. Pressing on, if you don't like the idea of dodging an attack, you can indeed parry. This is done by attacking at the very same moment that an enemy attacks you, essentially clashing your weapons together, allowing you to get a very swift reprisal on it, just as if you dodged. Though the timing on this does seem a little bit tighter, as you'll have to take into account the time it takes for Clive to swing his sword. A new addition, and something that I was entirely surprised to see, is that you can execute weakened enemies on the floor. If you've attacked an enemy substantially, their health is very low and perhaps they're on the floor stumbling struggling to get back up, you can use a context sensitive attack to have Clive rend their literal souls from their body uh, and shuffle them off this mortal coil. That is essentially a more fancy way of saying Clive will literally run them through with his sword and move on like nothing happened. Final Fantasy veterans won't be surprised by this next fact, and that is that you cannot change your equipment during battle. I learned this the hard way, as I'd started a fresh run of the demo, having forgot to change from story mode to action mode, realized mid-fight, and then found the fact that I could not change anything via the pause menu. I did say I'd cover the whole action mode, story mode aspect, and I guess it's finally time that I do talk about it. In this game, you can equip accessories, up to three of these accessories, I believe, that will do certain things in this game automatically for you. There's an accessory here that will automatically dodge attacks for you. There's an accessory that will automatically give you a potion if you're low on health. 
there's an accessory that allows you to simply press and hold the attack button, which will have Clive throw out a multitude of interesting and cool looking combos. Then we have an accessory that automates all of Torgal's attacks, allowing you to let the AI handle that if you simply just want to fixate on item shortcuts. And you have the autofocus, which will slow down time any time an attack is coming Clive's way, throwing up a big dodge prompt on screen, allowing you to dodge attacks with more ease. And though I myself barely played with the story mode accessibility accessories enabled, the majority of the footage here that you're seeing from Square Enix, I believe, has a lot of these enabled. And in fact, they were quite adamant uh, that we explained just what this was in the fact that this isn't standard gameplay, but merely features that can be enabled for those who simply just want to enjoy the story of Final Fantasy 16. And with that, there's just a handful of combat things I wish to discuss before moving on to Icon Combat. The main thing I want to talk about is battle rewards and combat performance. Throughout a myriad of these clips that you see Clive fighting in, you'll see on the right hand side of the screen this ethereal glowing text pop up into frame, and this is the combat performance system. Whenever you parry enemies, dodge enemies, do these things with fantastic timing, defeat enemies, take damage, you'll see all of these things pop up on the screen, which are essentially grading you on how well you take on that combat encounter, culminating in a battle report at the end of an encounter, uh, which essentially judges you on how well you fought. And the rewards that you get from these encounters directly tie into your combat performance, where the better you perform in combat and the better the grade you have, uh, the better the rewards. With the rewards being AP or ability points, experience points, items and gear. This is the game's way of essentially rewarding players that decide to engage with the game's mechanics and learn the intricacies of the combat system. And last but certainly not least, the final thing I want to talk about before moving on to Icon or Summon Battles is cinematic QTEs, quick time events. These are a thing in this game. I was absolutely shocked to see these things pop up. Uh, it's something I absolutely wasn't expecting. Being completely engrossed in the cutscenes and the quality of the animation and the graphical fidelity and such, seeing these pop up uh, was a bit of a shock to the system. They are timed, of course, which means that you can fail them if you're not careful, but there's essentially three things that you're able to do. You're able to dodge an attack, you're able to struggle, and you're able to just reprise with your own counterattack. Uh, and these are all color coordinated, different colors, so you'll know exactly what to do with the button you're pressing just at a first glance. Okay, well, I've just spent the last 15 minutes absolutely gushing at you about the combat of Final Fantasy 16, and I'm happy to say that we're still not done and that there's plenty more to come, but now it's time for us to talk about the summons or the icons as they're known as in this game or in the world of Velisthia. So in this demo, I got to face off against the icon Garuda in two different variants. The first was as Clive with the standard combat system I've just talked about at you at length, and the second of which is Icon vs Icon Combat, a grandiose battle, almost as if two towering kaijus were facing off against each other. And as I mentioned earlier at the start of this video, Naoki Yoshida the producer mentioned that each and every Icon vs Icon battle plays out entirely different from one another. In this particular battle that I'm basing my experience off of, it was Ifrit or Ifrit against Garuda in a very large open field with nowhere to hide. And the combat here is a lot more simplified, shall we say, than the standard combat system I've just talked about, where you essentially only had four options at your disposal here, four different things that you could do. The first of which was attack, of course, which is a very close range attack. Then you had the option to dodge, dodge whatever attacks that Garuda threw at you. You had the option to throw a fireball at Garuda, so essentially a ranged attack. And you have the option to lunge, which basically allowed you to close the distance. And if you're able to hit Garuda whilst you lunge, it would have done a great deal of damage. And though I called this combat simplified, I didn't say it was easy. There was still a level of strategy you had to employ against the boss if you wanted to grasp victory. 
You had to time your attacks to ensure that you did them at a moment of vulnerability, and you had to know when to dodge as Garuda threw out some pretty hefty attacks that you couldn't stun her out of. At certain moments, if you strategized and timed your attacks just right and were able to land a full melee combo on Garuda, it would go into a context-sensitive QTE, which allowed you to do an increased amount of damage. Overall, the entire Icon vs Icon scenario was incredibly cinematic, there were plenty of QTEs that you were able to get stuck into, uh, visually it was a fantastic spectacle to witness, and it culminated in Ifrit using the fan favourite move Hellfire to, to essentially obliterate and best Garuda for good, which had me absolutely jumping for joy, especially seeing that Hellfire animation play out in so many other Final Fantasies before this. Forging ahead, it's time to discuss items and gear. In Final Fantasy XVI, Clive has access to two pieces of defensive gear, being a belt and a bracer, which of course you can swap out for whatever you want, and he has access to one weapon slot, being a sword. To complement this, he has three different accessory slots. As previously mentioned, these accessory slots can be used for whatever you want, uh, along with a whole slew of the accessibility features I've previously discussed. That brings us onto the item section, where Clive of course is able to use items like potions and high potions from the menu, or he can set shortcuts for him to use in battle. Something I'd quickly like to note is that along with the return of potions and high potions, we're also able to use tonics. Tonics are consumable items in Final Fantasy XVI that have a variety of different effects. For example, one of the tonics that I saw during my time with the demo was a tonic that let me rapidly and quickly build up Limit Break. And with that section swiftly discussed, now we can talk about abilities. There is an extensive list of abilities that you can procure in Final Fantasy XVI. A lot of people have seen in previous footage and images uh, something that looks very similar to Final Fantasy X's Sphere Grid, but I'm happy to say that that is not the case. You have a whole variety of different radial wheels in which you can pick and choose whatever skill you want at any given moment without having to buy others as a prerequisite uh, or move along some sort of Sphere Grid map. Abilities are bought with AP or ability points, and ability points are gained from combat. Of course, as previously mentioned, the better you do in combat, the more AP you get and the more abilities you can buy. Going one step further, you can upgrade abilities you've already purchased to master them, and mastering abilities essentially provides better effects for that ability overall. For example, by mastering the dodge via upgrading, you'll have a longer dodge window to get a just or precise timing, allowing you to counterattack. Or for example, there is a lunge or stinger ability in this game which thrusts Clive forward in a violent motion. By mastering this ability, the range of this lunge is extended, allowing you to hit enemies from greater distances. And the beauty of this system is that you can refund your points at any given point. If you purchase an ability or master an ability, test it out and realize it wasn't worth the ability points, you can simply refund those points and spend it anywhere else, essentially allowing you to respec your entire build whenever you want. And if you are ever unsure of what ability to purchase next, perhaps you see the extensive list and suffer from option paralysis, you have the option of having the game auto-buy abilities for you based on abilities that perhaps they think are helpful or vital to the player experience. And so those are the notes and details of my fleeting moment, my several hours of Final Fantasy XVI essentially laid bare. If I were to leave the subject of objectivity, of details and facts, and go into my thoughts and impressions and give you a subjective angle on Final Fantasy XVI and what I thought of it, uh, I can safely say that the game went above and beyond my expectations. Before going into this event and before getting hands-on, I was already hyped and excited and had great expectations of this game. You know, being a fan of the series from Final Fantasy VIII uh, and also seeing all the pre-release content and knowing that the battle director worked on DMC5, a game that's received numerous acclaim for its combat system and its combat mechanics, uh, I knew that we were in for a treat with this game. There was a small part of me that perhaps was slightly hesitant, coming off of Final Fantasy XV and following that game from when it was Versus 13 and seeing the state of that game at launch, you know, a game that I enjoyed but ultimately felt a little disappointed with, all of that was essentially minute compared to how excited I was. 
and it was great to see that they really leaned in hard on the action aspect of the game. I was curious to see what sort of balance they would strike between the standard RPG features you've come to know and love from a Final Fantasy uh, and the action aspect that this game promised, uh, considering it can be quite hard to strike a balance. Sometimes things might feel a little clunkier than they're supposed to considering they're a merger of essentially two wildly different genres. Uh, but I'm excited and happy to see that they've managed to, to do well with Final Fantasy 16. And I'm not just talking about the combat and the battle scenarios here, I'm also talking about numerous other aspects of Final Fantasy 16, from the visual fidelity and attention to detail, to the astoundingly fantastic soundtrack, to the darker, more mature narrative they're going for, and the fantastic voice acting to match it. Funnily enough, I had the privilege of meeting Clive's voice actor, who, by the way, is just a bigger mega fan of Final Fantasy as a lot of us out here are. Um, whose performance really sold the emotional weight of the narrative that they're going for. And so given everything I've just said, and my own experience with the game however limited it may be, it should come as no surprise that I am absolutely looking forward to Final Fantasy XVI and the full release in June 22nd. That does come with a caveat of course, that I've only played an extremely small vertical slice of what is the entire Final Fantasy XVI experience. I mean, let's be honest, these games are several, several, several hours long. But something tells me the level of quality that I've seen here uh, will likely last throughout the entire experience. And so with that, we come to the end of this video. Thank you to everybody who managed to stick around to this very point. Uh, let me know down in the comments below what you think of Final Fantasy 16, especially after this latest information blowout. Uh, and with all that said and done, it has been me, Devil Never Cry. I'd like to thank all of you for watching. And as always, I'll see you all next video. 